Vice Chair Williams, can you hear me? Vice Chair Williams, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Um, we're going to just get ready here in a minute. I will start the recording and I'll tell you when it's good to go. Okay. Recording in progress. Okay, Vice Chair Williams, it's 7 p.m. and we can get started. Oh, oh, just we need to have a couple other commissioners. There we go. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, great. Um, welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of February 8th, 2022. At this time, we will do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, at this time, I will like to ask for a roll call, but before we do that, I just wanted to uh, mention and let everyone know that Chair Ramiro Maldonado has stepped down and has resigned from the Planning Commission. So this evening, um, as vice chair, I'll be serving in the position of chair for tonight's meeting. So at this time, we could do a roll call. Chair Williams? Present. Commissioner Ebnetter? Present. Commissioner Nugent? Here. Commissioner Patel? Okay. Um, I would like to remind everybody that due to the physical distancing protocols in place at this time, we continue to encourage public participation remotely. Information on how to provide public comment is explained at the bottom of the published agenda, and there are two ways to participate. Join the Zoom meeting by clicking on the link at the top of the agenda. Use the raise your hand button to be called on at the appropriate time. Phone-in participation can be done by calling for area code 408-638-0968 with the conference ID number, uh, meeting ID number 861-2210-9964 and a passcode of 086072. When the item of interest is open for consideration, Press star nine to raise your hand and to be called on. When called upon, press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and then provide your comments. These options for public comment will remain available until I close the public comment period for that specific item. Okay, with that, I will move on to uh, item number one on the agenda, which is the Planning Commission meeting minutes. Um, I would like to uh, have the Planning Commission approve the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting from December 14th, 2021. Are there, is there a motion to approve? Or I'll motion to approve the minutes. Okay, thank you. I was, I was gonna say, I guess I should be asking if there's any comments or questions on them. But if there are no comments or questions, Seema, do you uh, make a motion to approve? Yes, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the December 14th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Thanks. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Thank you. With that, the meeting minutes are approved from December 14th, 2021. Um, excuse me, Commissioner need Williams. I think we it. need a roll call vote. Oh, thanks. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a roll call okay. vote of that. Chair Williams? Approved. Commissioner of Netter? Approved. Commissioner Nugent. Approved. Commissioner Patel. Approved. Okay, four, approved four zero. Thank you. Um, item number two on the agenda is the public, oh, I'm sorry, at this time, it's the, I'm still getting used to this. At this time uh, is the public comment period. 
So uh, during the public comment period, members of the public may speak on general items of interest within the commission's jurisdiction that are not on the agenda for the evening. Each member of the public may speak for a maximum of three minutes with a maximum of 15 minutes for the entire public comment period. The commission shall not act on or discuss any matters raised during the public comment period, which are not on the agenda, but shall refer such matters to staff for review and or request such matters be placed on a future agenda. And uh, I guess, I'm not sure if I need to make a reminder of the remote commenting procedure as well. Uh, if So you'll find on your agenda how to comment on that. Do we have anybody from the public that would like to comment on something that's not on the agenda? Chair Williams, I don't see any hands raised at this time. Okay, we'll just give it Sorry, another. There's a hand that was just raised. Mark it. Oh, they put their hand down. <laughs> okay, they put their hand down. Okay. Uh, so on the general public comment period, it sounds like there are no comments from the public at this time. All right, we can move on to item number two. And um, Mary, would you introduce the item? Item number yes. two, 3125 Clearview, Clearview Way proposed outdoor amenity space for food trucks, PA 2021-047. Great. Um, Linda Lee is the planner, and Linda, are you um, ready to go ahead with a staff presentation? Uh, yes, I am. Thanks, Chair Williams. I just wanted to quickly check that you can see my PowerPoint. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Um, good evening, members of the Planning Commission and the public. Uh, my name is Linda Lee, Associate Planner, that will be leading the presentation for Agenda Item 2, a public hearing. The project before you tonight is a site plan and architectural review and site development planning application for a proposed outdoor amenity space for food trucks at 3125 Clearview Way, PA-2021-047. The project is located within the existing Clearview Office Park, uh, bounded by Highway 92 on the east and West Hillsdale Boulevard on the south. The office park consists of two parcels with a combined lot size of 21.9 acres. The site is zoned E1-1 for executive office and is currently developed as an office park. Adjacent uses include the College of San Mateo on the north. A Laurelwood Shopping Center is located further east of the project site. The project will reconfigure portions of an existing surface parking lot located above West Hillsdale Boulevard. As shown in the aerial image, the area of work is adjacent to steep slopes uh, that range between 25 to 34% slope and includes slope heights of 52 feet to 80 feet, which makes up the slope setback area. As proposed, the project requires removal of 27 parking stalls and 18 existing trees. The proposed improvements include reduced and replaced uh, paving, new seating, landscape features, and parking for the food trucks. The applicant currently anticipates up to two food trucks providing weekday lunch service. The amenity is intended to provide convenient lunch options for employees of the office park and will not be open to the public. There are no changes proposed to the existing office buildings or structures. The requested approvals include the following a site plan and architecture review, our SPAR, for proposed modification of the existing uh, parking lot. It also includes a site development planning application to allow site development within the slope setback area. It's important to note that the food truck is proposed for employees only. Uh, should the food trucks be open to the public, uh, a separate special event permit will be required. The site plan and architecture review uh, for modification of the parking lot um, includes reducing the overall off-street parking count. However, adequate parking is provided uh, by an existing five-story five parking structure and nearby surface parking lots on the site. 
The project also proposes an abundance of new landscaping that includes 19 new trees and drought tolerant planting. The full plant list is included within the landscape plan of attachment three. Overall, the proposed amenities and increased open space appears to greatly enhance the character and enjoyment of the office park. The site development planning application reviews any site development proposed within the slope setback area. This includes removing and replacing the existing asphalt and concrete pavement as outlined in the grading plan and rendering on this slide. Minimal site grading is proposed to ensure that the general topography remains similar to the existing condition. Over 8,000 square feet of the impervious surface will be converted to natural vegetation uh, to further reduce stormwater runoff and improve drainage of the site. Public input heard so far includes general questions regarding the project timeline and location of tree removals. Uh, staff did receive one public comment requesting a sidewalk along uh, the Office Park West Hillsdale Boulevard. Uh, this comment has been shared with the appropriate city departments for review and consideration. Regarding environmental review, staff recommends the following categorical exemptions under the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, um, as an existing facility and accessory structure. No significant impacts are anticipated with uh, implementation of the recommended conditions of approval. In summary, staff recommends the following actions by the Planning Commission. Approve the categorical exemptions as an existing facility and accessory structure based on the findings and conditions of approval. Lastly, adopt a resolution to approve the site plan and architecture review and site development planning application for partial reconfiguration of the existing parking lot as an outdoor amenity space. Okay. So this concludes staff's presentation. Uh, the landscape architect and applicant have joined us tonight. They will not be providing a presentation, but they are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, at this time, I wanted to see if there are any questions from the planning commissioners for clarification. <clears throat> I just, um, uh, Chair Williams, I, I do have a question. Now, this might be for the applicant, uh, the landscape architect. Um, is it all right to go ahead? Yes, go right ahead. Oh. Um, I was just looking through the, the plans in the Arborist report, and it, it looked like the Arborist report showed some trees to be removed that I couldn't find in the vicinity of the actual project. Are these trees that are elsewhere in the parking lot? It looked like a number of young, newly planted, perhaps crepe myrtles. Um, and I'm just curious, it seemed like the actual project site had relatively few trees to be removed compared to the 18 that's listed. I just wanna get a little clarification on that. Uh, this is Paul Reed with Reed Associates. Uh, we uh, have planned to replace some of the parking lot trees, which uh, there's a couple of trees that are nearly dead. So we wanted to, to replace those. Okay, thank you. That's what I figured. <laughs> Great. Anyone else have any questions? Through the chair, I have one question. Um, I, I saw that... Uh, there's going to be a loss of some EV spaces that'll be relocated. Um, it, the, the staff report, I believe, also mentioned the loss of two motorcycle parking spots, but did not indicate whether or not those will be relocated as well. So I was curious um, if the applicant has any information about how utilized those spots are and if there is any plan to relocate them. Yeah, through the chair. Yes, go ahead. I have a, yeah. So I have a quick comment on the off-street parking. So the zoning code requires, you know, just the standard parking for the vehicles and it does not mention the motorcycle, but I'd welcome the applicant to respond to that regarding the typical usage. Uh, yes, hi, this is uh, Kari Acock. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, go right ahead. 
Okay, great. Um, yeah, as for the uh, EV um, uh, uh, parking spaces, those uh, have already been relocated um, to a little deeper in the, the parking lot. The, the site has ample uh, EV parking at this point. Uh, you may know that Tesla is one of the tenants there, um, but in addition to that, there are uh, type two charging stations located throughout the parking lot uh, the parking lots, as well as the parking structure, um, the first couple of floors of the parking structure. Uh, as for the motorcycle parking, uh, I have not seen any motorcycles parking there. Uh, we did a renovation there recently, uh, and uh, those spots were not being utilized. Um, seems like it's mostly cars that are being parked there at this time. But um, uh, I'm sure that it's partially due to COVID, but uh, there's so much parking available currently at the at the business park okay thank you commissioner admitter did you have any clarifying questions i do not thank you okay uh i had a question that i think i think was answered but can you just is was it was the public hearing triggered by the um slope setback encroachment or why exactly was the public hearing for this triggered yeah through the chair yeah correct so the slope setback um triggers the planning commission level review because the slope height adjacent to it um is over 25 percent slope and yeah so that's the trigger for it yeah okay um all right thank you for that um all right at this time we can open it for public comment uh, Mary, do we have anybody waiting to ask, um, to, do we have any speakers um, waiting to speak? Chair Williams, there are no public comments for this item. Okay. Okay, so um, if we don't expect any public comments or questions at this time, then we can close the public comment period and bring it back to the Planning Commission for any additional questions or comments. Um, so who would like to start? Does anyone have comments about this? It's it's um, probably not going to trigger a whole lot of comments from us, but I might guess. Um, yeah, through the chair, I'll, I'll start. Great, go right ahead. Uh, I generally think this is like a really fun and cool project. I have nothing to add, really. Um, I think this site looks great. Okay. Um, Commissioner Abner, do you have anything to comment on? Um, no, I'll, I'll, uh, I have the same feelings as uh, Commissioner <laughs> Nugent. It's a great addition. Okay, great. Commissioner Patel, do you have any comments? Uh, no, just that uh, I agree. And it sounds like there's already an excess of parking at this site. And I think converting it into outdoor activated space for people, especially, you know, eliminating some impervious surfaces is a fantastic use of, of that space. Great. Um, I will basically say the same thing as all the other planning commissioners, with the exception that I I understand why it's not open for the public. It's part of the office parks, you know, private property and use for their employees, but <clears throat> it looks like a nice place for the public to stop and get something to eat on, on the way back from the gym or the farmer's market or whatever. So, um, but that doesn't sound like that's an option. So uh, I think it's a great use of um, space. It sounds like the, a lot of parking is there, a lot of asphalt. So now we're gonna get some landscaping, which is really nice. Um, I think uh, there's one other comment I was going to make. Uh, it sounds like the, you know, drainage and slope issues have been well addressed and they're not any different than the existing conditions. So in terms of drainage and slope. So I, I uh, think that looks like a great project. Nicely done. So with that, um, if there's no other comments or questions from planning commissioners or the public, then I think um, we can uh, go ahead and um, make a motion to approve this. Would anyone like to make a, rec a motion to um, um, for the items before us on screen? It's two items really, and one is the 
categorical exemption and the other is the um, approval of the site plan, the SPAR and the site development planning application. Through the chair, I'll, I'll make a motion to recommend a determination of categorical exemption as an existing facility um, hold on. and accessory structure based on the findings and conditions of approval and adopt a resolution to approve the site plan and architectural review and site development planning application for partial reconfiguration of an existing surface parking lot as an outdoor amenity space for food trucks located within the slope setback area at 3125 Clearview Way. Can anybody second that motion? I'll second it. Great, thank you, Commissioner Patel. Um, I would like to take a roll call vote. Mary, can you take a vote for us? Chair Williams? Uh, yes. Commissioner Abnetter? Yes. Commissioner Nugent? Yes. Commissioner Patel? Yes. Okay, great. With that, it passes four to zero and um, congratulations. <laughs> That's, that closes that item. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, our next item, item number three, is a study session. And Mary, would you please introduce that project? Yes, item three, pre-application review for a proposed five-story mixed-use building at 616 South B Street, PA 2021-036. Okay, great. Um, welcome, Summer. Um, Summer Smith is the planner, and um, you can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Williams and members of the Planning Commission. Before I begin, I just want to confirm that you can see the presentation and hear me clearly. Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Summer Smith, Associate Planner, here to provide the staff presentation for PA 2021-036 for 616 South B Street pre-application study session. The project site consists of two parcels, which are made up of five previously subdivided lots and has a land area of 0 0.64 acres. The site is bounded by South B Street to the east, 6th Avenue to the north, and 7th Avenue to the south. The site is zoned C1-3 slash R5 and is with the downtown specific plan area. The existing uses consist of tapped, tap plastics and Kellymore paints in addition to two at-grade parking facilities. The adjacent uses include multifamily developments to the north and west of the project site, a mixed use building with commercial, residential and office components to the south and commercial uses to the east along South B Street. This slide shows a 3D aerial view of the project site and the surrounding neighborhood. It should be noted that the multifamily residential buildings along 6th Avenue are about five to 10 stories in height while the multifamily residential along 7th Avenue are generally one to two stories and there's one three-story building thrown in there. The proposed five-story mixed-use building consists of approximately 96,000 square feet with 10,500 square feet of leasable commercial space, lobbies, and circulation area on the ground floor. There are also 48 four-cell residential units on floors two through five. The ground floor is outfitted for three commercial retail tenants and the second through fifth floors consist of a mix of one, two and three bedroom units. Common and open space areas are proposed on the first, second and fifth floors. Additionally, the project includes a two level on-site parking garage consisting of 40 commercial parking stalls on the ground level and 65 residential parking stalls on one level below grade. The project as proposed does not provide any on-site loading where one loading space is required by the zoning code. Here is a list of codes and policies that are applicable to this project. A full evaluation of the project's conformance to them will be completed during the review of the formal application. 
However, today, today staff will focus on the state density bonus law as it applies to the project. California government code outlines density bonus standards for residential and mixed use projects that devote a portion of residential units as below market rate housing or BMR. Under the C1-3 slash R5 zoning district, the, mass, the maximum density is 50 units per acre. This allows a maximum base density of 32 units for the 0.64 acre site. The applicant proposes to devote five units or 15% of the base density to affordable housing at the very low income level. This would entitle the project up to a 50% density bonus which yields an additional 16 units. The 50% density bonus would allow the project to have a combined maximum density of 75 units per acre or a total of 48 units. The provision of 15% of the units to the very low income category also entitles the project up to three incentives or concessions, the reduced on-site parking standards and waivers from development standards. As proposed, the project is requesting requesting one incentive from to reduce the setback requirements along 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue to utilize the statewide reduced parking ratio for residential uses of 0 0.5 stalls per unit and one waiver from providing on-site loading facilities. It should be noted that the placement of loading facilities on the street or within the public right of way requires the approval by the city manager. The applicant held a virtual neighborhood meeting on January 20th in which 13 members of the public attended. Staff has also received 19 public comment letters as of 4 p.m. today. The main concerns raised at the meeting and in the public comment letters include building height and size, reduced setbacks along 6th and 7th avenues, traffic concerns, the addition of green space at the pedestrian level, noise levels associated with the second floor common open space, and the preservation of the maple trees along 6th Avenue. At this time, staff asked the Planning Commission to provide input on the overall project as proposed with specific focus on the project's options for compliance with the city's below market rate inclusionary program, the building's overall architectural style and transition from the surrounding buildings, and other project aspects that should be considered during the formal planning application. The city has adopted a below market rate or BMR inclusionary program that establishes minimum affordability requirements for residential projects proposing 11 or more units. The city's program also establishes that very low income units cannot be used to satisfy the BMR requirement for for sale projects unless a monetary reserve is established for those owners to cover any future costs related to increased home ownership association dues or assessments. Therefore, the project as currently proposed would not comply with the city's BMR inclusionary program, given that it provides for sale units at the very low income level without establishing a reserve. Additionally, it should be noted that while very low income ownership units with monetary reserves remains an option under the BMR program, the city has found that occupancy of these units are practically infeasible due to the upfront financial cost for the prospective owners. There are several alternative means that the project could utilize to comply with the city's BMR program. The applicant may redesignate the same percentage, 15%, as low to moderate income units. However, state density bonus law would afford the applicant a lower density bonus and would therefore reduce the total units proposed. Or the applicant could utilize one of the three alternative means of compliance that would allow the project to keep the 48 total units. The three units include devoting, I'm sorry, the three options include devoting 44% of the base density or 15 units to the moderate income level, devoting 24% of the 
of the base density or eight units to the low income level, or the applicant can choose to keep the percentage and income level at 15% very low income and propose all rental, all rental units as opposed to for sale units. When evaluating the alternate means of compliance, does the commission recommend that the applicant retain the current number of residential units at 48 and opt for one of the scenarios to the right? Or is the commission amenable to a reduction of total number of units if the applicant decides to propose 15% moderate, moderate or low income, which is a minimum affordability required under the below market rate program for ownership units? Next, we'll address the building design and massing. The project's overall, overall architectural style can be, considered, can be considered contemporary due to its use of contrasting building materials and massing techniques to distinguish between the residential and commercial uses in the building. The ground floor consists of large glass windows segmented by porcelain tile columns and a continuous overhead aluminum canopy to express the commercial level. The design utilizes cement panel cladding with accents of glass, wood, and metal incorporated throughout the balconies at the residential levels. The use of these materials continues along the building's north and south facades onto 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue for the surrounding uses transition from commercial and mixed use to residential. Because the project is adjacent to a residential district, the zoning code requires that the project adhere to the same front yard setback of 20 feet that's required in the R6-D district. As previously indicated, the applicant intends to request a concession through state density, excuse me, through state density bonus law to eliminate the required 20 foot side setbacks along 6th and 7th Avenue. Additionally, the building holds a consistent 54 foot plate line height along 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue. This can be viewed as an abrupt transition from the lower scale two-story buildings that are adjacent on 7th Avenue. At this time, staff is requesting that the Planning Commission provide input on the overall style, design elements, and massing of the building and whether the project is compatible with the existing scale of the neighboring buildings. Staff would also like to highlight that the project is subject to the Housing Accountability Act. The commission may provide recommendations. However, the project is only required to comply with objective design standards found in the general plan, zoning code, and other adopted policy documents. When evaluating the design of the proposed building, staff recommends the commission consider the following questions. Would the Planning Commission recommend providing some amount of setback along 6th and 7th Avenues to create a better transition and increase compatibility with the adjacent neighborhood? How does the Planning Commission recommend improving the transition and building height when compared to adjacent uses? And does the Planning Commission recommend this project be reviewed by a third-party design consultant during the formal application? Lastly, staff requests input on other as aspects necessary for the commission to make positive findings when the formal planning application is, is submitted and reviewed by staff. Currently, staff anticipates that the project will require a site plan and architectural review for the new mixed-use building, grading, and associated site improvements, a site development planning application for tree removal, and a tentative map for the merger of the five existing lots into one and the creation of 48 condominiums. Following the study session, the applicant will have the opportunity to revise the design based on feedback given by the public, planning commission, and staff. During the formal, formal planning application, the project will be required to undergo technical studies, including traffic, noise, air quality, and others, in addition to a design review by a third-party consultant, if directed by the planning commission. When the formal application is deemed complete, it will be brought back before the Planning Commission for a final decision. Thank you, and that concludes my presentation, and I am available for any questions. Great, thank you for your presentation.
Are there any questions at this time for clarification from the planning commissioners? Through the chair, I have a question. Sure, go right ahead. Actually, I have two questions. <laughs> will there be an applicant presentation after this? Yes, there will be. Okay, great. Then I, I only have one question to ask right now, which is, um, I know you mentioned the HAA, Housing Accountability Act, um, in your presentation, but given the number of public comments that we received, written public comments we received requesting that the Planning Commission deny <laughs> this application um, due to the lack of setbacks or to um, due to the five-story building height, I was wondering if uh, one of our city attorneys could comment in a in a greater level of detail about the conditions under which we could deny the project and conditions under which we cannot deny the project, just so it's very clear to members of the public that may be listening. Sure. Um, this is Gabrielle Whelan, Assistant City Attorney, and um, the Housing Accountability Act applies to this project because it's a residential project and it requires that the city apply only objective standards when deciding whether to approve or deny the project. And as Summer mentioned, that means standards that are codified in the general plan or zoning code or elsewhere. Um, so that is one law that applies to this project. The other important law that applies to this project is the state density bonus law. And that's codified at government code section 65915. And there are two elements of that law that come into play here. Um, the applicant is seeking the use of an incentive or concession to reduce setbacks. And the applicant is seeking a waiver of the city's on-site loading requirement. Um, the goal of the density bonus law is to incentivize developers to provide affordable housing by granting those developers additional density. And so um, along to achieve that, the law requires that a developer demonstrate that a requested incentive or concession will result in a cost reduction in order to provide for affordable housing costs. And so um, when the formal application comes to the city, staff will be asking the applicant to demonstrate how the requested incentive or concession results in a cost reduction to provide for affordable housing costs. Um, and then in terms of waivers, um, a waiver is another benefit of the state density law and that provides that um, developers can seek waivers of development standards that would physically preclude the project from being built at its permitted density with the density bonus. And so that's another, you know, incentive that the law provides to developers to provide the affordable housing. And so when the formal application comes to the city, um, staff will be asking the developer to demonstrate how the requested waiver is necessary to accommodate the increased density. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Through, through the chair. Go right ahead. Um, so, Summer, you, did you showed the graph that the VLI does not um, work? with the state density bonus or does it not work with city city uh, guidelines or both summer you're on mute <laughs> you think after two years i get used to that um but through the chair um just to clarify state it the project as proposed does meet state density bonus law however the city's uh, bmr program requires 15 percent or it requires 15 percent of ownership units to be for low income or moderate income and not for very, it won't accept very low income in the city's program for ownership but it meets the state bonus density law correct yeah yet it's in conflict with the city's bmr program um, I'll yes. jump in. This is Gabrielle Whelan, Assistant City Attorney. And so while this, the city's program works in conjunction with the state law in that an applicant can, can use their BMR units to qualify for the state density bonus law, 
um, the two laws are independent. And so um, they would qualify for the density bonus using the 15% very low income, um, but that would not in turn satisfy the city's current below market rate program. So how does that conflict if the applicant, if the applicant um, is within state law, but is in conflict with BMR regulations? So the applicant could choose to carry on with the 15% very low income for sale units and take advantage of the density bonus that's provided by doing that. And then in addition, the applicant would need to independently satisfy the city's below market rate program. Most applicants choose to layer the two to use their below market rate program units in order to qualify for the density bonus. But it's also possible to, to choose an option that's available only under the state density bonus law and then independently satisfy the city's requirement. Okay. Um, and some are for the objective um, design guidelines and meeting general plan zoning uh, requirements. Does this project as it's proposed meet those guidelines? Uh, so in reference to the zoning code, the guidelines that we have there would be you know, the height limit. So the height limit in the zoning district is 55 feet measured um, from existing grade to the top plate line. This is in compliance with that being its plate line at 54 feet. Uh, another component would be the setbacks, which require 20 feet, 20 foot setbacks on 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue. But the applicant is choosing to utilize state density bonus um, to request waivers from those. Correct. So I don't want to muddy the water. Can the applicant request the setbacks and still be in conflict with the BMR regulations for the city of San Mateo? They can, they, they can request the, the waivers from the setbacks and still be in compliance with the program. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Nugent, do you have any comments or questions at this time? I mean, clarifications. I, yes, I do. I Just to follow up on something um, uh, Ms. Smith mentioned, the, uh, the to comply with the cities and the state's BMR program, does that mean you stack the number of units or you add the number of units or how do you, how does that get defined? So I'm not exactly sure how you would stack it if you don't do it, you know, layered. Most people choose to just do the 15% at lower or moderate for ownership units. And that way they automatic they automatically meet the cities and they automatically meet um, state density bonus law. However, if they were to, if the applicant was to keep the 15% um, ownership units, they would still have to provide, if the entire project was ownership units, they would still have to provide an additional 15% of low to moderate income units to satisfy the city's program. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. I have a clarification question about that. I thought that there was um, comment made about the, um, requirement of having a reserve if there if you kept the very low income units as for sale as for ownership and maybe you could explain that right so that is an option that remains an option in the um in the program however it's not really feasible based on um the history of this program in the city uh the city has found that the upfront cost of purchasing one of these units, even even if it's marketed for um, very low income, they, the, uh, the proposed owners just don't have the money for all the upfront financial costs that are associated with it. Okay. All right, thank you for all that. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a question, if I may. I'm sorry, this is, I, I'm having a hard time following this. It, it sounds like we're saying that there are two things in conflict here in terms of requirements from the city. So I want to make sure I understand this because on the one hand, I'm hearing the city will allow you to dedicate 15% of ownership units to very low income provided you have a reserve fund. But then on the other hand, I'm hearing the city doesn't want you to do that because it's not actually, it doesn't pencil out <laughs> to use a term that we use a lot. 
And so what is the city? I'm having a hard time understanding what the city wants you to do instead. Is it to do 15% low to moderate, but then that doesn't satisfy the state density bonus law. And that's where the trickiness arise. Yes. So it's, it's a layered, it's a layered topic. So if the applicant, so as the project stands now, the applicant or the application project meets state density bonus requirements. So it does not meet the city's BMR program requirements because the program specifically says that it will not accept very low income ownership rate, I'm sorry, ownership units unless a reserve is established. Um, since, you know, that since the program and that um, legislation has been written, there's been a history of those units being vacant because the financial burden for the prospective owners it's which are a very low income category is so high that they can't meet it. So those those units just sit empty. And so while it still technically remains as an option, the city would um, heavily encourage the applicant to look at a, an, another option. Even though that would re result in a reduced number of units, the Not, city would prefer that. They could provide um, a higher level of, or a higher percentage of moderate income or low income. So Got it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Because the, the trick I, is to, or is to say the, the point for the applicant, I believe, is to get to that 50% density bonus, so which gives them the total of 48 units. So 15% at very low income would give them the 50%, the 50% but that's not allowed in the, in the state for the city. So they could do 44% moderate, which is 15 units, or 24% low, which is eight units, and still get the total of 48 units. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. I think that hopefully clarified it for everyone. <laughs> so it's it's kind of a, I mean, it's obviously a math game here, a numbers game. Um, okay, so I think at this point, we could go move on to the applicant's presentation. Welcome, are you ready to? Present. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Moshe Dinar. I'm the architect and the applicant. Uh, with me is Chinar Desai, our project architect, who will be sharing her screen. And I'm going to... So, Summer did just such a wonderful job of, of going through this that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the building architecture, but I, I do want to uh, point a few things that are very important. We were the architects also of Nazareth Terrace, which is right across the street. Uh, the same owner has also built Nazareth Plaza. This is his third building on B Street. He is actually creating a context. Most of the buildings around us are much taller than we, than ours. Our buildings are four and this one is five. However, please notice that the fifth floor is set way back with a continuous trellis to really make the top level less less obvious. If you look at the other buildings built around on 6th Street, they all have very bulky roofs and they're much taller. We, in fact, there are three buildings. And if I may... The Strad Valley, Valley, which is five stories, has an extremely tall roof, which makes it equivalent to six. The Stafford has 11 stories. And the Gramercy has seven stories. Now, why are we asking for 48 units? Because it's not very difficult to build a five-story building nowadays with the construction cost of approximately $450,000 to $500,000 per unit and not have additional units. That is why we are working with this, the density bonus law. We have several projects in the peninsula and other places, and all of them are by the density bonus law. The density bonus law is what makes it possible for two things, for there to be housing on the market rate level 
and for there to be housing for, for people who need affordable housing. It also makes it possible for the developer to have enough units to be able to afford the project. It is a great solution and we need to work with it. We have all told Sommer and we have agreed that we will maintain the 48 units. We will create the necessary combination, the necessary affordability levels that will maintain the 48 units and allow us also to provide at least 15% affordable units. Now, why have we not asked, why did we ask a concession for the den, for the 20 foot setback on B Street, on, excuse me, on 6th Avenue? For the simple reason that if we do that, we lose eight units. If we lose eight units, and on top of that, we have to provide another seven or eight affordable units, which carry no profit. We are now at a pos position where the income level is very difficult to achieve. We believe that the other buildings that set back on, on 6th Avenue don't have a single affordable unit. They're all luxury. They don't have to do what we are doing in this building which is we're asking to be accepted by the density bonus law and all our buildings have been accepted because it is an important thing and because we are providing a lot of amenities. Uh, Chinar, can you please uh, go through a few of the plans and items uh, Chinar Desai will share her screen. Um, uh, can you go to the front, uh, please? Chinar, the cover sheet. Sorry, it's going to take us a little bit to get organized here. This is this is the building, and one of the things that we wanted we want to do is we call this a tripartite design. We have th it's three components. Top, middle, bottom, middle, and top. The bottom is commercial. It's very glassy. It has a, a rhythm of columns to it. The middle is units, residential units. And what you can see is that the living rooms project out, the bedrooms project in and have balconies. Every unit has a balcony. Every unit has a balcony. We don't just throw in open space and, and forget that each unit should have a little bit of an outdoor space. We also think it's very important to articulate the corner. Nazareth Plaza has a curved design on the corner. Nazareth Terrace has a curve on the corner. It also has a continuous canopy all around the sidewalk so people can shop and not get wet. We also have a lot of landscaping all around and new trees. When you get to the second level, Chinar, can you please show the second level? Um, this, this shows the parking. On the second level, we have a 15 foot setback as required by zoning. We are not requesting concessions on all the sectors. We are only requesting a concession on the setback on 6th Avenue. On top of that, we have 21 foot by 176 foot landscape open space for the use of the residents on the second floor. So as you can see, it's really a U-shaped building with a court in the middle. So when all the other people from the other buildings can look down, they can see a beautiful Beautiful court. Uh, I hope Chinar can find the court, the similar court that we constructed on Nazareth Terrace. Uh, we have a photograph of it, and it's it's 
It is not something that people will have parties in there. It's a place to sit down and read, you know, ha have something to drink, a cup of coffee, read the paper. That's what it's made for. It, uh, it's not made for raucous parties. And some of these letters make it sound like we are going to build a, a nightclub there. We're not. This is a very quiet activity. Um, if you can find that image, fine. If not, we'll move on to the next. Janar? I'll try and find it. It will come later in the set with materials board. Um, okay. All right. So let, let's, let's keep going to the materials board and uh, then uh, we'll, we'll finalize and hear from other people. As you can see, the, the height of the limit is 45, the building is 45 feet, excuse me, 54 feet, 54 feet, five stories. It, it is much lower than any of the buildings around it. Next. Oh, no, can you go back to that uh, a section, please? One thing that you can see also is that um, on the ground floor, we have a trellis that hides the parking spaces so that you, you can't see them. And we did that also on Nazareth Terrace. It was very successful. Next, please. We also have, we don't have the standard one bedroom and studio, which is what most developments have. We believe that buildings should include young people and middle-aged people and old people and families and children. That's why we have a, a substantial number of two and three bedroom units that are, that are family friendly. Many cities now have family friendly requirements and our units are always family friendly. We provide a lot of storage. We provide storage in, in the parking area and we provide storage within the units. Next, please. These are some more plan, uh, floor plans. And you could see some of the materials that we, are, we have created. We have some, uh, the back of the building is a, is a darker color. The front of the building is a lighter color. Uh, so we also have a metal, um, Lattice work. We have what we call a signage band that continuously goes around the building so that tenants in the commercial spaces can put their signs, can put their letters and not create a hodgepodge of, of uh, architecture. So this is really what I wanted to, to explain and hopefully uh, communicate to you. Uh, as far as the setback on 6th Avenue, um, this is something that uh, is important to us. However, we understand that there are other buildings there that are set back. Um, but right now, unless uh, if we can get our 48, 40, 48 units, which is the max, the minimum that we can make this work with and we will make the affordability issue work. Uh, we can review uh, some of these issues. Uh, I, I thank you very much for your time and I'm, I'm eager to hear what you have to say. Great, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, at this time, I think uh, I can Go back to planning commissioners and see if there's any clarifications needed or we can move on to public comment are there any brief clarifications that people want at this time or can we move ahead to public <laughs> comments through the chair i have some additional questions for the applicant mm -hmm. okay sure um actually at first i have one for city staff which is can you remind me how many parking spaces there will be at kiku crossings garage which I believe is on Fifth Avenue. Staff is not aware of that at this time, but it's something I can look into and provide um, those numbers to you in the future. Okay. 
um, 500 and I just Googled it. Okay. <laughs> it's 164 residential parking stalls, but 532 public parking stalls. 532. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to, may I, may I say something? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, we are providing 105 parking spaces for 48 units. Our ratio is 2.19 cars per unit. And that is, in, in this day and age, a very high parking ratio. People yes, it is, not which was my next question, if, if I may ask. <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Which is, um, what, I, I'm curious what motivated the decision to include such a high amount of parking. Because um, this, so is, this is an enlightened developer. This is a developer who wants people to be happy to live there and not be constantly going around the block looking for a parking space. He did that on the, on the other buildings and also in the, in the plaza. There's underground parking and there's two levels of parking. This is a very expensive solution, but he, he, he believes in providing adequate parking. I know that now you can go to half, half a parking space per unit. We don't do that. We provide the required parking and that is what we're asking for. Okay. I will, I will limit this to questions. Um, so thank you. I believe you have answered my question. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you uh, for the applicant. So you need to build 48 units. You need the concession on 6th Street to allow you to, if you didn't have the concession on 6th Street, you would lose eight units, correct? Well, if they were the size of the air. I don't think they're related. Okay, I thought you said if you could if you couldn't have the concession on Sixth Street, then that would that then you would remove eight units. You would lose the opportunity to build eight eight units. Is that true or not? Yes. Right now, we, we what would happen is if we had to a twenty foot setback on 6th Avenue, we would have to take several of the units and squeeze them so that a two bedroom would become a one bedroom, a one bedroom would become a studio, and a three bedroom would become a two bedroom. In a sense, we are losing real estate. Okay. And right. because it goes up for four stories, you see, it's four stories to times 20 feet. You're losing a lot of real estate. Um, that is uh, problematic, but we we understand the request for for the setback. We we do, we do understand the request for a setback. But well, uh, why don't we why don't we also hear more from uh, when we get to the public comments? Uh, so I just it, want to, I just want to understand before we before you go, so I don't continue to think about it. So so, um, but would you be would you be willing to have eight? Below market units as part of your program, or are you set on the five below market unit or very low units? Uh, what we what we explained in in our discussions with Summer, and by the way, she's done a terrific job. We will find the right combination that gives the city the affordable units it wants that meets the density bonus and that gives us the 48 units that we need to make this project fly. It's not that hard to do. Uh, we've done it in, in other places. Uh, there is seems to be a conflict between two in, 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 in that I don't understand in San Mateo, on, honestly, but I, I think that we can maintain the 48 and provide the number of affordable units that the city wants. Um, Somer provided three options and we are going to review these options. This is a study session and by the time we come back, there will be a fully fledged uh, affordable housing component. Okay, great. So we've done Thank it. We've you. done it in all the projects. Okay. Thank you. So are there any other clarifying questions? To the chair, yes. if I could 
quickly interject and clarify that the, the setback concession that is being sought is both on 6th and 7th Avenue. Yeah, I, I thank you for saying that because I was, I, I know it's clearly stated that it's 6th and 7th um, goes to the property line without a setback, without the required setback. So, okay, thank you. Uh, can, excuse me, can I ask a question? Sure. My, our understanding was that there was no setback requirement on 7th, only a setback requirement on 6th. That has been my understanding throughout the entire process. So we, that's why we... Uh, uh, um, I, the chair? Yes, go right ahead. Yes. So the zoning code requires um, the setback on 6th and 7th avenues because it is the project is adjacent to the R6D zoning district. So the front yard that is required um, for that zoning district should is going is required to be applied to the side setback um, for the property on both of those um, both of those streets. I think um, without getting into further discussion. So here, are, are, we, are, we, are we required to have 20 feet on 6th and 20 feet on 7th, which means that our building is 40 feet shorter? You, well, go ahead. Under the zoning code, you would that would be the requirement. However, you have the ability to utilize waivers through state and city bonus law to okay to thank eliminate you that, this that's effect. so that's what we're doing thank you I, pre I appreciate your response thank you i think this might be something we'll get into a little bit more detail um, as we um you know provide comments and further discussion um so i do want to keep moving on to the public comment period as well yeah <laughs> through the through the chair i i do have one more question that I'd like to ask before public comment. Um, and this is might be for the applicant or it might be for um, our planners. And it is just to refresh my memory, what are the the volume or the massing concessions that are available if we were to consider alternatives to say the setback for um, the one or both streets? And, like, is there any alternative concessions like height or any other thing that would be uh, under the state Dennis city bonus law? Through the chair um, and uh, Gabrielle, please um, supplement my response as needed. But the a concession can be used for, you know, any development standard that would, if the applicant had to uh, um, abide by it, it would, it would not save. So, the concession could be used to to provide cost reductions to um, to allow the affordable units to be built. So, if at the density that's proposed, so therefore the a concession can be applied to the setbacks because the setbacks would prohibit the affordable housing to be built as as at the densities proposed. So there's a number of different um, concessions that are available. I believe height is one of them. So I'll follow on um, Ms. Smith. So this is Gabrielle Whelan, Assistant City Attorney. Um, so the state law defines a concession or incentive to include a deviation from any development standard. So it could be any development standard that the city has in place. So it could be height, it could be FAR, it could be setbacks. Um, but the planning commission's charge is to consider the project that's being presented to them, um, not to redesign the project for the applicant. And so the goal is to give feedback on what's being proposed by this applicant. And, and let me know if I can answer any other questions. Okay. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay. Uh, great. Then I think we'll go ahead to public comment. Um, Mary, how many speakers do we have? I guess at this time, people can go ahead and raise their hands if they'd like to speak. Do you have any speakers, Mary? Yes, they're still raising hands at this time. Uh, 
Chair Williams, there are five hands raised at this time. Okay. Um, I, if there's five speakers, I'll go ahead and propose three minutes per speaker. Does anybody have any comments on that? Or is that acceptable to everybody? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and have the first speaker. Do you want to... Uh, go okay, ahead. Hold on, let me... Sorry about that. Okay, so Mary, who's our first speaker? Our first speaker is Frank Garitano. Frank, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Go right ahead, Perfect. Frank. Perfect. So I just want to thank, uh, you know, Ms. Williams, all the members of the Planning Commission, uh, Mr. Dinar for presenting his application, and Ms. Smith for all of the hard work she's done on reviewing this and, uh, and sort of bringing this to our attention. Um, my name is Frank Garitano. I'm a homeowner, actually, who lives uh, at the Gramercy on the Park, which is on Fifth Avenue, or sorry, on Laurel Avenue between Fifth and Sixth, so across the street from the proposed development. Um, and I'm actually happen to be president of our homeowners association of 144 units, although I am actually speaking tonight just on behalf of myself and not necessarily on behalf of the other owners. Um, but I will say um, I am very grateful uh, for sort of the acknowledgement on the part of Mr. Dinar and the planning commission about the, the hardship that the proposed setback with the development seems to involve. And I'm glad to see that there is been quite a bit, a bit of attention and debate uh, paid attention to that tonight. And I do want to recognize that, uh, you know, this is the only building on 6th Avenue that would not have that 20 foot setback. Um, and so I do think it's not sort of in keeping with the character of the remaining buildings and the rest of the neighborhood. Um, I do have some concerns. I know that there's a similar building on B Street and 9th Avenue that does not have the setback. And one thing I've noticed as a neighborhood resident is that that building actually frequently has flooding on the commercial floors to the point that the commercial tenants are required to actually place sandbags outside of their, their front doors to prevent flooding from intruding into their unit. And I do have some concern that not allowing for a proper setback might predispose the, this new development to that same type of concern. Um, <clears throat> I do think uh, that the lack of sort of open facing green space along sort of the, the space of the development on both 6th, 7th uh, Avenue is sort of a detriment to the community. Um, and I'm also just wanted to point out I'm a little bit disappointed that um, it seems like there's even some uh, com communication sort of failure as it relates to whether or not even the setback is required on both 6th and 7th Avenue. Uh, it was great to hear the developer acknowledge that the, the project could be uh, developed with the 20-foot setback uh, with some modifications to the units, but I was a little disappointed to hear that the developer was so surprised to find out that that setback would also be uh, in face on 7th Avenue. And so with that, I would just really urge the Planning Commission, you know, we, we all sort of want to make sure that we have uh, enough and affordable housing in our community. But at the same time, I think we all choose our community because of, uh, you know, the many amenities and green spaces and sort of the development uh, as it currently exists. And I, I think we want to make sure that we do our best to protect and preserve that. Okay, thank you, Frank. Who is our next speaker? Our next speaker is Boone Kang. Boone, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, go right ahead, Boone. Can you hear us? <laughs> we can't, we're not hearing you yet. Maybe we'll move to the next um, speaker and come back. Okay. The next speaker oh. is Naomi Avram. Naomi, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. I think I did. I know. I mean, we can hear you. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible because I have already written a letter. Oops. Now we're not hearing you. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible because I have already written a letter addressed to the commission. My name is Noemi Avram. I am a licensed architect principal at Gamma Avram Architects, and I 
had practiced in downtown San Mateo for 30 years. I know the area very well. I have walked it numerous times. And uh, and again, I'm not going to repeat myself, but I do uh, want to point out one more thing that the architect mentioned, that this is about real estate for them. And for the rest of us, it's about the community, it's about downtown, it's about the experience of walking along uh, Sixth Street and uh, already uh, seeing the uh, Central Park, the jewel of downtown, already permeating since be all along um, uh, 6th Street. And I'm not going to mention uh, 7th Street because I believe in my, in my opinion, um, and it's just an opinion, 7th Street is a street um, uh, in transition. 6th is not. It's already built. It, it already has the setbacks. It already provides for a continuity. And uh, I'm sure that there can be adjustments. Uh, I understand that the role of the commissioner is not to redesign the project for the applicant, but there's always ideas, just as Ms. Uh, Smith um, uh, offered uh, opportunities for the uh, BMRs, for the uh, uh, affordable housing to be met. By the same token, maybe the three units can be reduced. Are you going to have a large family in downtown? Um, maybe yes, maybe not. But uh, there is the possibility of an adjustment in the um, number of bedrooms of the units for them to keep, for the applicant, for the developer to keep their desired real estate uh, to make, obviously, the income that they need to make in order to provide the building. Um, but perhaps reducing the units, um, the, the uh, mix of the units. Um, I urge you to consider this in particular 6th Avenue. And in addition to that, there hasn't been any site plan that shows uh, the entire uh, block. It doesn't have even to be um, to scale, but just a diagram that would show clearly how the impact of offsetting, of eliminating the setback on 6th Street with regards to the other buildings. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for your comments. So can we have the next speaker, please? Yes, um, Boone, can you try to speak again? Yes, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Sorry about the mix up with my setting. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, input our views for residential units owners around the neighborhood. The first thing is, uh, uh, Mr. Diner, I'm happy to hear that he, his owner, developer, is uh, an enlightened uh, individual. Um, and I would like to recommend to him that he should consider the fact that in the future, the number of self-owned car, especially in the Bay Area, if nothing else, if nowhere else, will go down drastically. The two car per family days are over. So if he could save a lot of more space by reducing his parking ratio to a more appropriate number reflecting the future, maybe he would not have any dilemma in the total number of units that he needs to make it a commercial proposition, which I, we understand he needs to do in order to, to, to develop the building. The second comment I have is if you take a look at the uh, neighborhood facing the 6th and the neighborhood facing the 7th Avenue size, you will see a stark difference. The 7th Avenue uh, across the street from this proposed project on the 7th Avenue, they are all shops. They are not residential. So they probably do not care about the setback. On the other hand, every one of us in the Gramercy is going to face an oddball building. In the block facing us, there are, there are going to be three buildings. This new one will be the odd man out, pardon the sexist expression. Um, the other two buildings, Strat, uh, Strat uh, Bally and the Stratford, are now setback. So it, it offends your aesthetic 
feeling, forgetting the fact that we are owners, which are, could be self-interest. Um, uh, it's just it's just so strange to have a beautiful town where 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 setbacks are sacrificed, and that is permanent. I hate to say this, but whatever achievement we can do in affordable units, that problem that has will evolve. There will be many, many different challenges, different solutions coming along the way. But the moment the building is cast in stone, it is going to be there forever. And in my letter, I said that I've lived in 11 cities and I love the character that San Mateo stands for. Please don't change it just because we need to have more units. And uh, um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Boone. Thanks for your comments. All right. Who's the next speaker, Mary? The next speaker is John Hirschberger. John, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, express our concerns. I too am a, an owner uh, in the Gramercy. And uh, I will simply want to add my voice to the others who have expressed concerns about the setback or concession of setback on 6th Avenue um, and a factor that hasn't been brought to light. To, I, I, I did put this in a letter earlier, so I won't dwell on it uh, at any length. But uh, uh, another factor is that it's, it's our understanding that the trash room for the entire building opens on to 6th Avenue. And if you've got an exemption of the setback requirement, the dumpsters there will create unavoidable congestion out into the, spills out onto the street itself. We know this because we, uh, we experience it on a regular basis uh, uh, right now. So that, uh, there are twice weekly pickups of trash and once week, once a week pickup for recycling. You know, the combination of, of, the, uh, of that happening out in the middle of 6th Avenue in, because of lack of a setback, uh, the noise and congestion of rolling dumpsters and trucks picking up and dropping off dumpsters, that would be a major source of irritation for those of us who live nearby. And I think the combination of not having a setback and having all the trash and recycling being dealt with on 6th Avenue really is kind of, from our point of view, an unacceptable uh, perspective. Uh, so we're pleased, uh, by the way, to uh, to see that the Planning Commission itself also recommends uh, not uh, conceding that, uh, that setback. So those are my comments. And I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to make them. Thanks. Great. Thank you for your comments, John. Do we have any other speakers, Gary? Yes, we. The next speaker is Ryan Motashimi. Ryan, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Good evening, um, commissioners, um, Vice Chair Williams. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you today on this proposal. And Mr. Dinar, if you are still at the computer as well, um, I would just like to um, comment one in support of actually a statement that a previous commenter had made. I believe his name was Boone. Um, and I think the comment that the age of two car ownership is over is definitely something that I would, I mean, it's something that I hope that as a society we strive for. And I personally do not think that an enlightened, an enlightened developer, it makes you to incentivize driving and car ownership by providing so much more parking than seems to be necessary. Um, so I would love to continue hearing a discussion into how to reduce the number of parking uh, spaces, especially because it seems that construction costs are a serious concern for this developer, but he's also proposing building a lot of parking that will raise the cost. So while I'm not well versed into what exactly the requirements are based on his comments, um, it doesn't sound like they're building the minimum parking that's required. Um, regarding other issues, I would say that I'm uh, 23 years old and I hope to at some point in my life raise a family and I would love to have my kids live in a, in a beautiful building. And I think that the architecture personally is nice, a beautiful building very close to one of the greatest parks that I've spent my whole life growing up in and riding a train in. So I would definitely appreciate 
<laughs> the ability to live there. And I think that having a variety of bedroom uh, numbers of bedrooms and units, like two or three bedroom units would be useful. And that's why I'm actually personally okay with um, not with not uh, keeping those setbacks and getting waivers for those setbacks because it allows for that greater variety of bedroom types. Um, so yeah, those are my main comments. The, the parking I think is too much and it kind of doesn't get us towards our vehicle miles traveled or greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Um, I would prefer there to be less parking. And I uh, also think that, um, especially since this is a five-story building that isn't even taller than other buildings around, um, that it's fair to uh, waive the setback requirements. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Okay, do we have any other speakers at yes. this time? Yes, um, the next speaker is the Stratford Activities. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi folks, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Camille Christie. I'm the executive director of the Stratford. I did send in a letter to the planning commission on behalf of our residents, but I wanted to verbally address a couple of things that have come up. It's possible I don't quite understand how the courtyard in this proposed building would work. Um, <clears throat> but in our letter, we did talk about having a rooftop garden. Uh, what we've seen with our neighboring buildings is that Although they may be five stories, elevator shafts and other additions and other industrial equipment raises the profile of the building quite a bit. And since we are a taller building, we do look down, on, we would look down on this development and we would ask that, you know, early in this planning process, a qualified landscape architect could give their input on how to build a rooftop garden, which would really make our view so much better. And um, I think would add value to the actual residents that would be living in this building. And the second thing is for parking as someone that has lived in this neighborhood and worked in this neighborhood, I, I know we're in the age where we are having less cars and families, but the parking in this area really is impacted. So, you know, I have nurses in the middle of their ships that have to go out and move their cars every so many hours because there's not enough spots. So I err a little bit more on the side of having plenty of parking so that there is nobody in that building that is parking on the street because parking there is already so limited um, and impacted. Uh, those are my comments and I really appreciate your time and you folks hearing our comments on these things. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next commenter is Marcus Corley. Marcus, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Marcus. Are you there? Did I make it? Did it happen? Can you no, hear? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Go Thank on. You. Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, the chairman and commissioners, uh, first of all, I would like to just thank you for this opportunity and for your time and energy that, <clears throat> that I know you care about the city of San Mateo and, and we do too, but we all have different points of view. I also want to thank uh, Mr. Dinar was a, a, a revelation because he is so articulate. Uh, I wish I could talk like he can talk because he makes everything sound so believable. Um, he was even able to get away with a poor me uh, kind of comment that, you know, oh, God, we're, no, I'm all for the low rent housing. I'm all for getting, getting that in place. But, you know, the city of San Mateo doesn't go out and hire someone to build buildings in it. Builders come because they think and they know from experience uh, that they will make a profit on this building okay it's business and um and the parking don't underestimate the value of the parking in this building to the building uh and you know depending on how they do it with their organization that parking uh will bring in a lot of revenue to somebody 
around there. Uh, and I don't understand how you can have a building with as many people and not have a loading dock or a place for a, 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 a trash receptacle, you know, exchanges to go on <clears throat> walking the street for significant periods of time and increasing the noise level tremendously for the surrounding buildings. Now, um, I'm not, um, I'm not saying uh, anybody should feel sympathy for people who live in the Gramercy. You know, it's a nice place. It's my home. I live here. And I am so glad that it, it came about in an era where setbacks took place, because just take a look at it. The setbacks give you room to plant trees, to soften the corners. The city of San Jose just reported that building any building corner all the way to the corner increases tremendously, uh, heard on NPR with the mayor's talk, that uh, pedestri automobile, automobile pedestrian accidents increase dramatically and there are a very high percentage in those blind corners. Now we have a lot of old people in these buildings trying to, trying to have a nice life and, and believe me, it's hard enough to get downtown. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Um, all right, we appreciate your comments. And I thank think you. we, can you hear us? Are we, do yes, we? Yes, thank, thank you very much. I thought okay. it was Okay. I appreciate I know, it. I just, saw, I just saw the timer flashing, so <laughs> thank okay, you. I so saw much. it too, so I stopped. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Not everyone does that. I appreciate that. All right. We'll go on to the next speaker. Is there anyone else there, Mary? Um, yes. The next speaker is Martin Wiggins. Martin, you can go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Thank you for hearing my, my comments. Uh, I'm a resident of the neighborhood uh, for, for about a year now. And uh, prior to that, lived uh, just north of downtown. So I've been walking, biking, and driving through this area uh, for probably eight years now. And I'm very excited to see, uh, although I've gone to that paint shop, very excited to see more neighbors, more housing in a transit-oriented area. Uh, I think it'll make a great addition. And so I just wanted to be a voice of uh, support for new neighbors. I, I can't, as someone that goes by here every day, can't understand what how much difference a few feet on either side would make on a building that's not as big as the other ones, but uh, I respect everyone else's wishes that, that lives around here and just wanna voice support for welcoming new new neighbors here and uh, excited to see it move forward. Hopefully it does. Thanks very much, that's all. Thank you. Okay, any other speakers? Yes, uh, we have Beth Chang. Beth, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Beth? We can't hear you. I don't know if you're mute. It looks like you're muted. Can you hear me? Hi, I'm so sorry. Now we can hear can you. you. Hear yeah. So uh, my name is Beth Chang, and I've lived at Strad Valley since 2006. Through these years, I could see the increase in the number of population that uh, has um, has been in San Mateo. The town itself, if I could say B Street and First, sec Second, Third, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Avenue, has become such a dirty area. You know, the city can't even take care of the the area. It is trashy. So now we're going to have more population. There are more cars. You think that because the new building here is for the population to use public transportation. However, nothing has been mentioned about public transportation. They've increased the number of cars uh, for, for the residents of the new building that's proposed. So I would like to know what the city is going to do about how they're going to clean out 
the street with this number of increased population and then increased traffic. And if you have young children around and elderly people that are in this area, the cars have already uh, ignored all the stop signs and crossroads. And I have constantly asked the, um, uh, the traffic uh, work to actually place stop signs rather than these zebra crossings or flashing lights. If you sit at these crossroads, you would be surprised how many cars run these zebra crossings. So to me, with an increased number of population, less green space, I think this architectural building should be reviewed again. So that's my comment. All right, thank you, Beth, for your comments. So Mary, do we, how many more speakers do we have? There is no more, pu no more public comment speakers that have not already spoken. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for your comments. That's, uh, they're always really helpful to me and enlightening. So um, at this time, I think we'll bring it back to the commission for our um, comments and discussion. Now, um, Summer had a couple of a couple of slides that I thought um, were helpful. I'm not sure if there there wasn't sort of one, you know, like one comprehensive slide. It seemed like there was two or three for the kind of areas that you wanted to um, have us talk about. Should we pull those up again? Would that be helpful to everyone? Through the, through the chair, could I could I see the factual data sheet? Uh, prior to going to the sure. question and comment period, please. Yeah, let's see if Summer can find okay. that. Yeah, I'm pulling that up right now. While you're looking for that, I also made a note of a slide that I thought might help in the discussion. And um, we can go back to it later, but um, slide three, I thought sort of showed the neighborhood juxtaposition nicely. Okay, can, um, you, all, can you all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. so um, we're a little over on the far. Um, we're within the range for the uh, density Oh, that's helpful. So we've gotten sixth and seventh street, no setback at all. And we've got two and a quarter times more parking than is required. Is that true, Summer? Uh, through the chair, that's the required parking listed on the factual data sheet is using the reduced statewide parking standard of 0 0.5 stalls per okay. unit. So they're providing um, well over that amount. Okay. So um, and there's a little less common space being provided. Twelve percent less. Okay, so the okay, that's all I wanted to see on that sheet. Thank you. Um, so maybe since there were quite a few comments about the setbacks, if you could go to slide three for me, then um, we could just maybe spend a moment so everybody could view that, and then uh, I think it would be helpful to go to the the bullet points that you had um, sort of asked us about. Yeah, I think it was that one. I guess it was that one, yeah. Yeah, so the red line is the project site, obviously, so. Um, okay, so at this time, I guess, uh, are there any 
of the planning commissioners that would like to go ahead first with their comments. And, oh, well, I guess I should ask at this time, should we um, have the planner bring up the slide that had the points of discussion? Maybe that'd be helpful. Was there one, was there like two or three slides that encompassed that, Summer? There you yeah. go. Great, thank you. I think the follow-up slides might be helpful too, but we'll, this is a great starting point. Thank you. Um, okay, who would like to provide their comments first? Through the chair, um, because this worked so well last night, should we do this one at a time? Like, should we do comments on the BMR first, then building design and massing, and then anything else? Mm -hmm. I was wondering that because they're two really different <laughs> issues. But sure. There, there are more topics than this to discuss or, or are th is this it, Summer? That must be a summary of it, I guess. Cause I, th are, I remember it was. These are the discussion questions. Um, these are all of the discussion questions that were, that were asked. You, you took it away. We're not seeing it now. Oh, really? There um, it is. Okay, um, yeah, these are the, all of the discussion questions that were asked. I just, in the presentation, I broke them up into different slides. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, I, I almost feel like we should talk about item two, building design and massing first, because uh, the concession of the setbacks is, well, maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, Seema, do you have a preference since you suggested that? Do you have a preference for which one we go start talking about first? Yeah, I thank you for asking. I think maybe one, because in some ways it seems simpler and may inform number two based on what we think about number one. <laughs> okay. okay, so let's start with number one. So the below market rate inclusionary program. And oh, so, so I'm, I'm sorry. Um, before we start, is it even an option to down zone this building if the applicant is asking for 48 units? Is it even a, 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 an option for us to say no? Through the chair, I heard the applicant say that they would do whatever is possible to keep the 48 units, which I took to mean that they would pick the option that Ms. Smith discussed where the number of units increases from, you go from five very low to eight low to keep the 48. Mm -hmm. So th this might be in some, this might be somewhat of a moot discussion point because it sounds like the applicant is willing to make the 48 happen by using one of the other recommendations to make that happen. Right. Through the chair, if I may provide a point of clarification. Yes, go ahead. Um, so on this topic, um, this this level of detail can be sorted out during the formal application review. So I think what we're looking for is input on if the commission has a preference on one path or the other, but the legal details of what is and isn't allowed or how they comply with state law, that can be fully worked out through the formal app. So that doesn't necessarily have to be resolved this evening. I think we're more just looking for your input if you have a preference or a position on, on the options outlined by staff, um, but knowing that it'll be refined further. And then the other piece was, I just wanted to um, um, respond to Commissioner Ebenetter's comment. Um, any aspect of this project is um, can be discussed by the commission. You're not limited by these topics. And we kind of introduced that with number three, which any anything you feel is worth discussing, you should, you can, Feel free to touch on. We just wanted to tee up the discussion. No, I, I appreciate that, Zach. I had just been um, a little confused because I thought when the presentation came through, there were two different sheets showing items that needed to be addressed. But I, I'm not. Yeah, I, I think you you're right, that. and I think that's because the like item number one is broken out into more detail in the subsequent slides. And I'm not sure if item two here, but but the um, item number one, there were clear like choices 
Uh oh, my internet connection. Oh, is that me? Um, anyway, I think there were some options that were yeah. presented to us. So, so, so if we would, if we would like, um, um, I would be more than happy to discuss item number one and get in my opinions. Um, yeah. So, um, is the applicant still um, on the call? You see, I thought he had possibly dropped off. No, he's yeah. still on the call. I just, um, he's in the audience. If you have questions for him, I can unmute him, but. Um, okay, perfect, thanks. perfect. Um, so, you know, the below market inclusionary program, I, I, I've kind of changed my, my initial thought process. And that would be to go to the eight units um, of, uh, low income, not very low, um, because of the non-performance as the city has stated um, with the other program, it just hasn't worked out. Yet with that said, I think that to say that you need the concessions to make the project feasible, the two concessions to make the project feasible to me, there's more to the story. And the fact is, is that if you're building twice, over twice the amount of parking that you need, you could reduce your parking substantially and use it to reduce the cost of the very low units and sell them at a considerably reduced cost um, than you would have had to if you keep this building over parked and I'm not sure what the cost of the parking itself, but I would think it's probably between 10, maybe, maybe eight and $10 million. Not sure. But I think if you, if you, if you wanted to stay with the very low, you could price them at a market at a rate, that you that very income low people could afford if you reduce the parking total. Um, so that is something that I would like to see the applicant um, work through and see if it's feasible. I would rather I, I personally I'd rather have very low units in there or a mix of very low and moderate. Um, but I, I hate to price out people just completely shut the door on ownership of very low units. That's my comment on the, on that one, uh, Margaret. Okay. Um, I'm, Summer, was there options that we should see or do we, maybe we don't need it uh, from the next page. I think it was the next slide. I will bring those up for you. One second. Okay. And then um, among the planning commissioners who would like to comment next on this? Through the chair, I can, oh. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'll be fast, which is, um, I don't have a strong opinion about, uh, I don't have a super strong opinion, except that I would like to see 48 units retained, which will surprise no one, given um, how I often bring up our housing crisis in these discussions. So um, as much uh, maximizing the allowable units underneath the state density bonus law, I think is is the right priority. Um, and I agree with Commissioner Abnetter that if it's possible to keep very low units, or if not that low units, that would be preferable because while we do have very limited rental options in our city that are very low or low, I don't know that we have any or many um, ownership options that are very low income. And I would love to see that be increased as, as a, uh, option for folks in our community. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Adam, do you have comments you'd like to make at this time? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I would first want to note that, um, I do, and I, and I please, uh, city planner, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think that if we undertake 
efforts to reduce the number of units that we do set ourselves up under to be vulnerable to the Housing Accountability Act. Um, and so not only do I have a, a moral moral stance that, you know, we are in the midst of a very severe and long protracted um, housing crisis where we are lacking, uh, you know, enough homes for you know, <laughs> uh, many, many people um, of all different income levels. Uh, and it's affecting, you know, young people especially. Um, but uh, I would note that, you know, I, in that light, I think that from a, both a legal stance and, and, you know, given the present circumstances, you know, trying to keep the number of units as high as possible is, is probably our best option. Um, that being said, I think that shooting for low income for sale units, to me, from what I've heard and what I've read, uh, seems to be the more reasonable thing from a feasibility standpoint. Um, ownership does require a lot of costs that often renting does not, uh, including, uh, you know, HOA fees, but also just other things that involve repairs and such. And I take to heart the experience that the city has had, um, that it could be, you know, not feasible for very low income folks. And I, I don't want to set up a situation where um, we're creating this opportunity to folks that becomes actually unhelpful or even like a point of stress for them where, you know, it's just not, it's not a feasible option for people under their, under their income level. And so as much as I would love, you know, personally to have lots of ownership opportunities for very low, low and moderate, you know, I think that the low income or moderate seems to be a better option given the financial circumstances. So looking at that is my preference. Um, again, I don't think this is, this is any, in any way like ordering the, the architect and the applicant, the, the developer to do one thing or another, but that's my input on this BMR program. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll just make a couple comments here. Um, I'm just going to say kind of an umbrella statement for <laughs> these two, this this item and the sort of other area as well, is that my takeaway is that there's some compromise here. I mean, that's what a study session is about, but um, but I think there's a few places to compromise. Um, anyway, that being said, a couple comments. One of the things I don't think any, did any of us comment on the, or question, I don't know if anybody brought up the question of could the very low income units be rentals and the rest of the building be ownership units? I don't know if that's feasible or if that's a complicated scenario, but um, anyway, barring that, then I personally think the low or moderate level is acceptable. Um, if that means, um, you know, that, that you can make this work and that the 48 units could be maintained. I, I'm going to talk about setbacks and things later, but I think that, um, you know, generally speaking, the option of going to the low or moderate units um, would help make this feasible. We want Through the to chair? Yes. Hi. So um, I spoke with Sandy Council, who's the house, housing manager, and she informed me that um, a combination of rental and ownership units is an option. However, um, it's extremely complicated to do. And so it would be up to the applicant if they wanted to pursue that scenario to, to figure out the mechanics of it. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I understand that. That does sound like a complex scenario and from a developer's point of view as well. So, I mean, especially. So um, given that then, I guess I would say the low to moderate um, units are acceptable. Um, let me just make sure I didn't have any other comments about any of this. Um, Anyway, I think I think generally that's all I have to say about that. Through, through the chair, chair, before we move on, um, Summer, <clears throat> I may have not have expressed this clearly. Is there any way to use a mix of the very low, the low, and the moderate to get to the forty-eight units and get the bonuses and make it feasible? 
Uh, I believe that is um, that is an option. However, they would only get to claim the density bonus for one of the income categories. So if it, I so at this time, staff does not know if they would be able to get the full forty eight units that way um, by mixing the income levels, um, because you have to have a, a pretty high percentage of each individual income level to get that that density bonus, and you would only be allowed to use one income level. So I don't know if that would meet that standard, but. It's something that the applicant can explore and we can look into deeper in the formal application. Right. And then I thought part of the issue was that the very low income level units um, are not recommended by the city because they don't see it as a feasible um, option for a home buyer. Correct. It, and that's kind of getting into if they want to do a mix of ownership versus rental or if they want to do all rental and a mix of income levels. Um, so there, there's a mix and match solution that the applicant could try to pursue, but it would be up to them to, to figure out how they would make it work with the 48 units. So I guess um, for, anyway, for my comments, I don't know about others, but um, I'm assuming that the developer wants to do 100% ownership units and not a rental mix or full rental. So um, assuming that's what the project that's before us is what we're looking at. Um, yeah, then those are my comments, but anybody else? This is a complex um, issue to some extent. So I wanna be sure, does anybody else have any comments or questions to revisit? Okay, I'm surprised that didn't, <laughs> that didn't entail more conversation. Um, all right, so then maybe we could go back a slide so we can just have a, um, the second discussion point. which was basically design. Uh, okay, this, yeah, forward slide, I guess. Um, so the other item to discuss is the building design and massing and that uh, staff is asking us to consider the setback issue on 6th and 7th and um, the transition in building heights and um, whether or not um, the project should have a third party design review process. So who would like to go for first on this? Through the chair, I can I can go first. Okay, if, great. Uh, nobody else wants to. Um, I would like to say that I, I have spoken to um, some folks and I have read through all the comments and, and hear um, the, um, the concern about the setbacks and I would like to see a way that uh, we can, you know, again, this is not about, you know, it's said that this isn't about, you know, redesigning the building, but in a sense, if we're talking about setbacks and we're talking about heights and, and such, we are. And so that that being said, I think it, I would like to see what we can do to make feasible um, you know, a, a way to get a, more of a setback on sixth. Um, and maybe that means we're not stepping back that top level and adding more units to that top level. Um, I personally, um, actually, and this isn't a feeling, this isn't like a, a an opinion. This is actually, you know, you know, found out through research that, you know, the difference in height is not as big of a thing when you're walking along the street uh, when it comes down to, you know, just a small percentage difference. Um, and so, you know, as a concession, I would actually find a height concession concession would be at least a height concession that was, you know, set back uh, would probably be more satisfying for the neighborhood, considering uh, there are already much taller buildings in that neighborhood. Uh, and I understand the, the desire for green space and, you know, space for trees um, along the, the sixth and Seventh uh, Avenue um, frontage, I, you know, there is a there is a benefit to having green space. Um, you know, as a landscape architect, I, I I think the trick is finding the right balance. Um, and maybe it's not. Maybe the concession is not. You know, all of the twenty foot setback. Maybe it's some 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 sort of sort of compromise in the middle to get this uh, project 
you know, to work. Um, the other thing that I think about, and this again has to do with concessions, um, is, uh, and this might be a question for staff, uh, is, you know, this type of pedestrian oriented commercial space at the commercial space at the, at the ground floor, you know, that's really a continuation of the, um, of the, uh, commercial avenue of B street further down or further North. And most of those commercial spaces are not fed with direct parking, um, you know, right behind the building. And I wonder if, if a concession might be more appropriate for the commercial space parking, um, uh, considering most people who are going to go to stores or restaurants in this site are probably going to be walking around downtown and parking in a more centralized parking spot rather than, you know, going to a, um, you know, like a, a shop that specifically is you're just going to drive there and then drive home. I just don't see that sort of um, that type of commerce happening in, on B Street. Um, and so that might be also another concession to consider if that results in the ability to um, produce the affordable housing that we want. Um, so those are, those are some of my thoughts in terms of like, how do we get uh, more of a setback on sixth? Um, and, you know, is there a way to tweak the top floor? Um, and, you know, that's, that's generally the comment on that. Um, in terms of the transition and building height between, you know, buildings on 7th, I mean, this is an urban area. Um, it will only become more urban. Like we have, we are going to experience a lot of growth in the next 20, 40 years in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, I just, it's not, we, we need to treat the city as, as a growing city. Um, and it is going to be growing and it, the addition of people will actually improve the city substantially, um, especially in this area, because they will be walking around, um, partaking in businesses, you know, making the place lively and providing tax revenue um, and all sorts of other good things. Um, so that's that's a good thing. I don't think transitions and building heights are, are really appropriate for a changing city Um in this urban context. Um, that being said, I, I just want to step back a little bit um, for a, and talk a, a little bit more about the design of the building. Um, I actually think the, the building is designed uh, attractively, um, a, you know, out of context. Uh, however, I think that just a general comment to staff and to, you know, my fellow commissioners um, and the people listening and the art, the applicant, uh, you know, you will get less pushback for many things. And it could be even setbacks if you design buildings in a more traditional style, uh, you will get less scrutiny. <laughs> it is you know, th there is a large contingent of people that that don't like contemporary or modern buildings, and it is it is a unnecessary source of friction um, for a downtown area that has such a historical element to many of its buildings, and so having a more consistent architecture with um, the, you know, pre-war, uh, pre-war buildings is probably going to get less pushback from neighbors for any, any variety of topics. So, um, you know, that's just something to put in your back pocket. Again, I'm not, I'm not looking to, you know, oppose a project because of this architecture. I find it actually to be fairly attractive. I just think in the context of downtown San Mateo, we would likely have seen less pushback if this was, you know, Spanish Mission Revival or some other sort of building that that is similar to the historic area of, of B Street. Um, 
take that as you will. You don't need to go redesign the style, but that's just, um, you know, something that I studied. And so it's just something that we should actually think about because reducing friction uh, for, you know, housing is important. Um, and then would this project benefit from a third party design review? Um, perhaps, you know, I'd like to hear what other commissioners say, especially if we are looking at modifying the mass and, and some of the, um, the way that the building works in order to, you know, accommodate a setback on sixth and, um, even, even ideally pr protect at least that, that street tree that it's been called a maple, but, uh, I think it's a sweet gum, uh, that's very mature. I don't know if that's even possible, but, you know, we could look at, at having, um, options for that from a kind of a value engineering perspective. Um, so those are my comments on building design and massing. And I would love to have uh, hear what other people say and I'm happy to join an additional discussion. Great, thanks Adam for your comments. Good comments. Seema, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. Um, so for the first question, providing a setback, I don't have a strong opinion about the aesthetics of a setback. I think some of the concerns raised by the public commenters about flooding is not a setback issue. It's a design and drainage issue. And that is something that should be paid attention to, to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, I think my, my only opinions about the setbacks are, I, I would, I would uh, prefer not to do anything that compromises the number and the size of the units. So if the trade-off is we do the setbacks, but it means we lose the three bedroom units, I would prefer to keep the three bedroom units. Um, there was a public commenter who said, are people with families gonna live downtown? Yes, people with large families will live downtown one block from the best park in the city. Um, I myself, when we were looking for a three bedroom place, we looked downtown, we wanted to live downtown. And at the time there were no three bedroom units available anywhere near downtown. And so I think it's great that um, this project is considering families and families with more than one child um, and, and accommodating them downtown. Um, so yeah, that's that. those are my thoughts on the setbacks. Um, similar to Commissioner Nugent, I don't have any concerns about the transition in building height because um, having just come off of our housing element meeting, I know that we are planning to build, we have to plan to build uh, almost 7,100 units over the next eight years and a large number of the sites in our inventory are downtown, um, partially because we're trying to push this transit oriented development. So to me, I don't know if we should concede a transition for adjacent buildings that may be very likely to be redeveloped themselves over the next eight years. Um, would the project benefit from third party design review? I don't know. <laughs> I've said this when we discussed this uh, before, I often find myself disagreeing with the third party design review. Um, but I think um, Chair Williams has made good comments before about architectural um, problems or features or considerations that are caught in a third party design review. So it, it may be valuable. And then just speaking on the overall design, completely echo Commissioner Nugent's thoughts. In fact, originally when I was evaluating this project, I, I had a similar reaction, which is one, these are subjective comments. So take with them what you will. You can listen to them, you can throw them away. Um, but we've seen a lot of projects come to planning commission for downtown that are utilizing that more traditional brick, um, clean lines, simple lines aesthetic. I. I think that aesthetic would fit in with downtown better. However, when we look at this specific site and when we note that there are two other Nazareth properties adjacent that are built in a more contemporary style, I think, I think this will fit in with the block. I don't know if it will fit in with the larger downtown area. So that's just my opinion on that. I'm personally not, if I've said this before, I'm personally not a fan of over-articulated facades or contemporary design. I feel like this already looks dated, <laughs> but that is a subjective comment. That is just my personal opinion and you can um, take with it what you will. I will say this might be 
I don't know if this is building design and massing or other issues, but I will mention um, as we are talking about design and as we're talking about the B Street frontage, and I believe that one of the corner ground units is marked as potential restaurant, we are seeing B Street become revitalized into more of a pedestrian mall. You know, we were closing off three blocks. We've seen two years worth of parklets in front of the restaurants. And so I would consider how that frontage along B Street could be activated to help support those use cases. Um, and then especially for that corner unit that may be a restaurant, you know, thinking about um, how you could enable outdoor seating. Um, Ravioli House is like a block away from this site and I eat there all the time and I love to sit out front and there's only two small tables and chairs and how can we enable people to be getting food from restaurants and residents of this, this apartment building to be getting food and then sitting outside and enjoying our outside. Uh, and then similar to that, again, not directly related to building, but related to design. Um, conformance with the bicycle master plan and pedestrian plan, I think is important. So that's something that, that the applicant should be considering as they move to the formal application and considering the fact that uh, because of the transformation farther down B Street into a pedestrian mall, and because of our own city's sustainability goals and moving towards, um, you know, reducing the number of cars on road and increasing bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, this section of B Street may see more pedestrian and may see more bicycle traffic, which is another reason to help, not another reason to think about how we can activate that outdoor space and enable people to congregate outside. I think those were all of my design comments. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Do you, I'm um, sorry, uh, Chair Williams, do you, do you mind if I just jump in just with one more? Sure. That, I, I forgot. It, I do, I do want to note, um, and I missed it when I was saying that I, I'm very caught, hesitant to allow a reduction in our sidewalk, sidewalk width that we have designed in our um, pedestrian master plan and this is a, this project is asking for that and i really don't want to do that so <laughs> that's okay. that's yeah. important clarification thank you yeah. absolutely um all right john would you like to provide us with any comments yes through the chair um i um like setbacks for buildings. I think they serve a very great purpose. Um, I believe that they make blocks feel more comfortable and engaging and welcoming. Um, and I also know that we want to maximize the amount of units in this project. So can we still have setbacks and go another story or two higher and ask for those concessions. I don't know, but that's what I would like to see as it pertains to the setbacks. Um, I am not worried at all about the transition in building heights. I think it kind of works at this height because when you look past it, you then have taller buildings behind it. Um, yet just for that short amount of view um, up and seeing the other buildings behind it, if you went up a couple stories and you didn't see that from street level, it'd be fine. I'd rather have setbacks. Um, and so I, I don't see, I, I honestly feel that all of these buildings that are four to five stories high are two stories too short. Um, but that's an issue that we're not able to address yet within our city. Although if we can ask for concessions to raise it and still have the setbacks, that would be my preference. Um, as far as the um, building design, I like the way the building looks. I think it's attractive. Yet I think it's setting. Um, it, every time I look at this building, I think of Bay Meadows development. Um, new, bright, shiny, somewhat contemporary um, and attractive. 
And it probably does work in this part of the town because of the reasons that Ms. Patel pointed out. Um, but I've also quite often looked at other smaller cities here on the peninsula where they're using more traditional type of buildings. Redwood City's done some great work as far as I'm concerned with some different buildings and they haven't seemed to have fallen into a pattern of repeating themselves um, with a lot of the same types of, of, of architecture. They've, they've mixed it up some and I've been impressed. Um, and we have gone in a different route um, and I'm not saying it's a bad route, but it's a different route. And I think we, I would hope that developers would, would start to um, look at the city as being receptive to different types of architecture um, and kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, I, I, again, I think this is attractive, but I really would like to see some more stone, some more concrete, some more plaster, different, different materials used um, to show a variety of product here in our city. Um, and as far as a third party review is um, concerned, I for one would love to see their input. So um, I guess um, we'll figure out if that's gonna happen. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I will go ahead with my comments. Um, uh, let's see, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Thank you to the applicants for the presentation. Very helpful and to the planner. Um, uh, let's see, I just lost, so I'm trying to thought there was something else I was gonna, another point I was gonna make before I started in, but um, uh, anyway, okay, so as far as building design and massing, um, we'll talk about the setback. Um, I, I think that the setbacks on 6th and 7th are really important. To me, it's, uh, it's very important. And I think actually some of the previous planning commissioner's comments have helped make the point. One was, um, of course, the pedestrian experience and the, um, uh, the other uh, item was the wide sidewalks and possible parklets or, you know, use of B Street for, um, you know, opening up a restaurant towards the sidewalk. But really the side building, building to the setback on B Street makes sense and maintaining the setbacks of 15 to 20 feet on the side streets, sixth and seventh, in particular sixth, to me is an opportunity to use those spaces for, you know, the front of your restaurant or the front of that storefront. Um, and instead of, and also an opportunity for some landscaping. So I think the side setbacks are very important. One of the speakers made a comment about the kind of entrance to Central Park. And I think that's what's unique about Sixth, which is why there was some question as to whether or not the, the requirement is on both sides and the concession is on both sides. So I there is a setback on 6th and 7th. I think they should be maintained on both streets. However, I think 6th is more important um, because it is kind of an entrance to Central Park. Um, however, if you didn't maintain the setback on 7th and you did maintain it on 6th, you'd be needing the, to use the concession um, I think even if you were just encroaching on one <clears throat> on one of the two setbacks, I don't know if that made sense to everybody. <laughs> but um, let me know if there's any questions about that. But that those are my thoughts. Um, I, I think that um, again, like I said earlier, I think the you know kind of the takeaway that I am seeing is that you know there's some compromise here. I mean, it's kind of a little bit of massaging, like you know maybe maintaining the setback on sixth not maintaining it on seventh, um, maybe reducing the makeup of the units or in order to not lose three bedroom units or any, lose any units from your count of 48, maybe it means reducing a little bit of the space in those amenities, which I know are really important and valuable to the people that live there. But, um, you know, there are some 
amenities like, like the gym or the um, the lounge, you know. So it's a little bit of massaging, obviously, of the of the plants, in my mind. Um, okay, so that was the that was the um, setback. The transition in building height. I guess I agree. I think I think it's actually well addressed here, um, from at least from what I can tell from you know um, from the from the front and well from all sides. I think it seems to be addressed pretty well in the design. So I don't. Um, I don't really have any comment on that. I think it's been nicely, nicely transitioned to that top floor. So I appreciate that. Um, bef uh, I'll just say, and then I'll talk a little bit about the design, but would the project benefit from third party design review? Yeah, I definitely think so. I do value the the um, work of, the, of Canon design. I think that we are looking at, um, you know, we're looking at it on a fairly broad level and they really um, get into a lot more detail um, and, you know, sort of the nitty gritty of what is this makeup of the mullions and the, you know, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of detail that, uh, that Larry Cannon and Cannon Design Associates goes through. So um, we're not equipped here to cover all that we cover and to cover that level of design. So I think it's important on a project like this. Um, oh, okay, going back to the setbacks, I'm going to look at my notes for a second. Going back to the setbacks, I just wanted to mention that, yeah, I do think that the difference between, or, or the things that we see on the adjacent buildings is that there is quite a lot of landscaping. The building across the street to the north, um, I guess it's mostly on 6th that has quite a bit of landscaping in the, in the around the adjacent buildings on their setbacks. So to me, I think that's worth keeping. Um, in terms of the design of the building, um, <clears throat> I think Commissioner Nugent made, a, made some really good points. Um, it's not, uh, although I think the applicant made, a, the architect made a really good point too, that you are setting the context by, you know, being adjacent to other buildings um, by the same architect and developer. Um, so that's certainly, you know, I want to acknowledge that. But I do feel that, you know, this little um, community of buildings is set between our kind of, I don't know, semi-historic downtown San Mateo and these neighborhoods of the Hayward Park neighborhood that are really, you know, homes from the 1920s, I think, a lot of them. So, um, so it's, you know, it's really right smack in the middle of of course there are some very modern buildings as well such as the leslie towers which is right on um on central park um very nicely done so it's been recently redone and it's kind of an interesting building for a very modern building um so my comments on the design of this um contact context aside i i think it's um I think it's great. I appreciate, you know, the modern aspects of it. I think there's kind of a lot going on. And I, I guess the corner element, I know, um, kind of echoes what's going on at the building uh, to the south. I think it was Nazareth um, Tower. I forget which what the name of it was. But the building to the south, I know, has the round um, corner element. But this corner element, I feel like, is a little too stark and a little too... It, it's almost a little shocking for for its placement. It's not, you know, it's not in the middle of a, you know, Grand Boulevard to to the park or to, you know, any particular destination. So I feel like it's a little bit overdone for what we what this corner means, and it might, you know, toning it down a little bit, making it less um, less prominent. I think would be more attractive to me. But again, that as you know, that is my opinion. I'm not sure what other design review comments would come out of um, the design review process. Um, so let's see what else. I guess that's pretty much it. Let me make sure. Um, I think I kind of covered it all. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I think I should say that I think that the mix of units is really great. I love that. I love that there's, you know, 
one, two, and three, three bedroom units. They're all very, you know, looks like there's a lot of variety, which is makes her a unique, interesting um, environment. Um, and the amenities look really inviting and, and a, like a great place to live. So, okay, those are my comments. Hopefully that helps. Through the chair? Yes. Um, one of the, one of the um, um, participants, uh, speakers, uh, spoke about the rooftop design, specifically around um, gardens, I believe. And that made me realize that I have in the past, frankly, suggested that um, rooftop gardens be used um, in these uh, multifamily settings. And I'm hoping that um, that will start to catch on in the area. I don't think we have many rooftop gardens um, where people are able to, you know, grow some vegetables. Um, but it, I, I would hope that uh, you know people could um, start to do that in their in their uh, homes. And um, I would hope that the applicant would consider um, some type of garden on the roof for the resident's use. Thank you. Yeah, I just wonder, given the amount of HVAC equipment that goes on the rooftops, how much is left over, but it's worth worth um, looking at. Okay, are there any other comments from any other commissioners? Through the chair, I've got a couple of general comments. <laughs> um, to, to piggyback on that most recent comment from Commissioner um, Ebenetter, also don't all, all residential buildings or maybe all buildings now require solar hookups. And so that I think is gonna take some footprint on the roof as well. Something else to consider. Yeah, that's um, why we, that's, that's to help us alleviate getting rid of a bunch of the mechanical units. Yep. <laughs> So my, my other general comment I wanted to talk about is to go back to the parking. Uh, I didn't quite get to finish my full question um, previously. And you know, I wanted to note that this project is proposing to build quite a lot of parking, almost double what is required. Um, you know, they're proposing to build 65 residential parking spaces when only 24 are required. And they're proposing to build 40, commercial spaces when only 20 are required. So double the commercial and almost double the residential. And this is when we have a new parking garage with 532 public stalls that is gonna be three blocks away. And you know the, the applicant said the justification for doing this is because this is an enlightened developer. And I would echo some of the public commenters um, comments that I actually think this is a quite backwards view of transportation. Um, you know, we're in the, everybody knows we're in the middle of a climate crisis. And the way we solve that climate crisis is by reducing our vehicle miles traveled and by getting cars off the road. And, you know, just yesterday we were in our housing element meeting where we were talking about policies and programs for housing to improve sustainability. And one of the things that came up was potentially reviewing and revising our minimum parking standards and potentially even setting maximum parking standards. And so I think if this project wants to be enlightened and wants to be forward looking, um, the, the direction that we seem to be going as a city, as a society is into more sustainable forms of transportation. And you know, we had a developer come before us, I think it was our September 14th meeting who noticed that they had recently opened a 40 unit building downtown that had no parking and that um, every single leasee did not own a car. And so I think the, the population of people who are now moving downtown um, may be different than the population of people who have lived there in the past. And it may be, may be a group of people that have fewer cars and are making more use of public transportation and are, are making use of our bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. We heard a lot of comments from the public about concerns about traffic well, if we can incentivize people to use public transportation and to use bicycles, then there's fewer cars and that's one way to reduce traffic. So I would, um, I would ask the applicant to reconsider the amount of parking in, in light of current trends and in light of the direction that our city is trying to go, which is to 
um, move in a more sustainable and climate friendly direction. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I think um, at that point, we, at this point, we've discussed all the areas that were requested by us, by, to, from, by staff. To Through discuss. the chairs. Yeah. Just a point of clarification. I know um, you hit upon this when you were speaking about the, um, the below market rate program, but the project manager has um, let me know that the owner is um, looking at doing all rental instead of ownership. So um, I, I guess that, that's the um, direction that they're headed in for the project. Okay, so that gives them, I think that that might open up choices for them then. As it, I, would, it would allow them to keep the same 15% um, at very low income and still um, receive the total of 48 units. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, well, that's good to know. Thank you for getting back to us on that. Okay, I think at this point then, um, we it's a study session, so there's no motions or votes to be done at this time. Um, I think um, we can probably close this item if there are no further comments or questions from anyone. Okay. Uh, through the chair, before, before, we, um, before <laughs> we close, I just wanted to clarify my comment about the setbacks and one of the reasons why I focus more on the sixth street or a couple of the reasons just so it's clear um the the one is that uh sixth street is on the north side of the building and so by stepping it back you're going to reduce some of the shade on the street and then the other is that seventh street um already has a lot of ha already has some buildings that do not maintain that setback and so it would be more fitting for that it's more eclectic uh in that respect and then also sixth street does have that nice view of the park um, so. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, I actually realized um, <laughs> that there was something else I was going to say too. I was going to comment on parking and um, suggest that you know that it's an opportunity for compromise because um, you know there is extra parking there, and so you know that would be a place where I mean, if you were to reduce the footprint of the building because of the um, um, maintaining the setback, you'd be reducing the parking garage as well. And so you'd be reducing parking. So I think there's some little bit of massaging that can be done to achieve all of those various goals. Um, all right, well, with that, uh, hopefully that was helpful to the applicant, to the architect and the developer. And um, we, I think we can close it and move on to our um, reports and announcements. Um, Zach, do you have any reports and announcements for us today? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there are a couple of topics I wanted to appraise the Commission of this evening. Um, first, um, looking ahead to our upcoming meetings, um, we are looking at canceling our second meeting in February, which would have been on the 24th. Um, at this point for the month of March, we, are we don't have any projects that are in the queue for this date. Um, we are looking at potentially bringing some code amendments if, if they're ready by that date. Um, so um, stay tuned, we'll, we'll know more as we, as we get closer to that. And then um, there is a question for the second meeting in March, uh, March 22nd. Um, this is the meeting that we are looking to bring the, um, the general plans land use and circulation alternatives um, before the commission for um, review and a recommendation. At that same meeting, we are also looking at a study session. And so I wanted to ask the commission or poll the commission on interest on holding that study session at 6 p.m., knowing that there's going to be a lot to discuss with the general plan um, alternatives item that's going to be scheduled. So we're not scheduling anything else. Um, the study session based on the scope of the project should go reasonably quick, but I wanted to um, poll you to see if everyone, if there's interest, and if so, if everyone would be available to attend at 6 p.m. if we were to um, schedule it that way. If not, we could do both at 7, but just thinking, knowing that there was a lot to discuss with the general plan update and wanting to respect everyone's time, I wanted to put that out there for consideration. Uh, 
Through the chair, I would be amendable to a 6 p.m. start. I would as well. I'll have to just eat dinner earlier. <laughs> Sorry, Hi. I'm frantically Googling right now. <laughs> um, I, I believe that previous weekend is the Planning Commissioner's Academy, and I know a few of us are hoping to attend. And so my concern is just having enough prep time, given when the packet is going to come out and given when the um, when the meeting is going to be held for us to adequately prepare ourselves on both on, on the general plan land use alternatives, which I'm sure is going to be very meaty, as well as the study session. So the Academy is the 16th, the, the Thursday, isn't it like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Yeah, but the packet packets come out usually Friday, right? Or, or Thursday? Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. It just it just seems like a very meaty meeting <laughs> for um, after after a week when many of us are probably not going to have a ton of spare time. One of the things, and actually, what I can do is we are getting ready to publish our general plan subcommittee um, agenda report, and it'll actually be relatively similar to the report that ultimately comes before the commission. So. Um, when we publish that report, which will be at the end of this week, um, I'll provide a copy to the, the commission. So that'll give you advance notice because, yes, um, there's a lot um, to consider. Um, we've got an alternatives evaluation that is that has a lot of content as well as other information that you want to spend some time on. So um, what I could encourage you on that topic is to um, start reviewing the materials now so you have ample time. And that, I think, could help um, on the time crunch as we get closer to that meeting date. How many of the of us are going to the um, planning commissioning academy? Oh, okay. I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure. I guess I should decide. Let's go. Let's make it 100. percent Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was very very helpful to me when I went in 2020. It was fortunately it was earlier in March. I guess it was fortunate. Fortunately, it was earlier. Otherwise, yeah, the whole thing would have been canceled if it was the same day it's March, you know, 16th or whatever. Um, Cause the world's kind of shut down at that point. <laughs> um, okay. Anything else? Um, oh, so, 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 so I guess I'm, I guess, is, what, yeah. How do we want to resolve that? If, if there, I mean, if, if anyone can't make it, we'll just hold it at the regular 7 PM time, but I wanted to provide that option. Um, so we can have, um, starting at seven, jump into the general plan alternatives and be able to get through that topic before too late. I, I think I, I could make it with enough notice. Yeah, it'd be fine. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that having it starting early would be preferable. I don't want to, I don't want to have it too late of a night if possible. <laughs> Excellent. Well, We'll go ahead and schedule that for this that March 22nd meeting. And then also um, end of this week when we send out the agenda for the GPS, we'll all also include all of um, everyone here on the commission. So that way you can start doing review of the materials that are that have been published for the general plan update. That would be helpful. Great. Thank you. Perfect. And then the next item I want to touch on was the Planning Commissioner Academy. So um, it's great to see the interest in attending that. Um, so we do have a bit of time, so we'll we'll send out some follow up information. Um, we'll proceed with getting you registered, and then provide additional information in in the coming weeks um, on what's covered, what the city covers, and how to how to um, file for those reimbursements, and some additional instructions on attendance. So uh, stay tuned for that, and then feel free to reach out to Mary or myself if you have any questions on that topic. Let me check. I think there was. Early start time, upcoming meetings, planning commissioners academy, and then yeah, the other item, as as um, Vice Chair Williams noted at the beginning of the meeting, was that um, Chair uh, Maldonado's um, resignation, and so that obviously leaves a vacancy on the commission, leaves a vacancy on the GPS, the General Plan Subcommittee, um, and then obviously um, the commission is without a chair right now, so. Um, I did um, talk to our city clerk and let me just pull it up. I got a brief overview where we're already getting going on the recruitment for a replacement commissioner. 
Um, and based on the timeline, um, ideally we can have someone seated um, maybe by the first meeting, but uh, more likely by the second meeting in April, if everything goes smoothly and we get a good pool of candidates. So um, if you, um, anyone in your networks um, um, might be interested, let them know that there's a vacancy and that they should speak to the city clerk um, if they're interested in um, applying for that vacancy. And then we'll also um, need to go back to council for an appointment to um, the vacancy on the GPS as well. So that'll, and that seat is reserved for the planning commission. So. Um, mm -hmm. oh, okay. So, so on, that, on, that, on that point uh, to the chair, um, when I was chair, when I was chair of the planning commission, I don't remember the exact scenario, but I was, I was never vice chair. I was voted directly to chair, which left me for some reason, like two or three months without a vice chair. And it was not a pleasant experience. So I think we need to fill the vice chair for if I don't know if we have to, if we have to vote for a new chair and then appoint a vice chair, but I think that that should be addressed sooner than later. Can I ask what, uh, how it affected you be, to not have- Because I was <laughs> The not reason I'm asking is because I'm wondering, was there something I was supposed to be doing? That no, I no, 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 it just made it, it just made it, it made it a little difficult, Margaret, because I didn't have anybody to bounce anything off of. Oh. So I was kind of on my own, which was fine, but it, it was, it was just, it was just a little bit more challenging was all. So I'm sure Margaret, you could do it. Absolutely. Well, I think that Ramiro is probably, um, you know, just like overwhelmed at work. And so he and I didn't really have a lot of, uh, you know, other, any other communication other than planning commission meetings. So I think that was part of the thing. You had too many conflicts with, um, other meetings and such. I was just going to pop up and say um, maybe this would be a good item to put on the next agenda for planning commission if we want to have a discussion of how to handle filling the chair position. Yeah, we could um, definitely. The um, I believe it's the first or second meeting in July each year where the a new chair and vice chair are elected. So we could we could place an item on the next meeting that we have to elect basically a chair and a vice chair to fill um, the remainder of these terms. So okay. that works with everyone. And um, the next meeting that we hold, which won't be the second one in February, but um, one or both of our March meetings will we'll add this item to the agenda. So that we okay. have both roles filled again. And the uh, question, I, one question I had was question of, of a quorum. So we, with, we, with five, we need to have three to have a quorum, right? And I don't know if we've ever had a meeting where there's been only three of us. It always has worked out that if someone's been absent, it, there's always been four of us. Yeah, so quorum uh, really just means majority. And um, so if there's four of you and there's a 2-2 two -two vote, is that what you're getting at? Then that, that'll be no action. Okay, and I what I meant was well, there's that, but if yeah, if we aren't appointing someone um, until I mean, if we don't have a, a fifth person until like April, then we might have a couple of meetings where we there's the four of us, and so if somebody couldn't was absent one night, for instance, it would be three of us. But mm, maybe and a meeting can be held with three since that constitutes a majority of the five. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so through the chair, uh, one question, and I don't expect an answer this evening, uh, Gabrielle. Mm -hmm. um, so, say for instance, uh, Margaret is um, um, moved to the chair, and I'm moved to the vice chair, and an item comes to us that I've already had Brown Act um, contact with, or have Brown been in discussion with. Um, either Adam or Seema, then what happens with the Monday meeting with staff 
and the chair and the vice chair to discuss that project. And I'll have to give that some thought. I'll give that some thought and get back to you on that. Okay. We hold two separate meetings. Well, it's, no, I mean, I, to me, it's an important aspect because we have so much going on on so many different items and I don't want it to become um, complicated. Okay, I can get back to the group on that. And then, um, you know, since we're on the topic of the Brown Act, um, if we want to have a, a more detailed discussion about the chair and the vice chair positions, I think we should put it on a future agenda. Perfect. Just wanted to give you something to think about. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, more to follow on that. Thanks, everybody. Great. If there's nothing else, I think that's it. We can adjourn the meeting. Thanks Is again. Okay, nice thank evening, you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. See you guys thank tomorrow. You. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye. We'll okay. see the best of you all. <laughs>